Let's pray together. Father, we thank you tonight. We bless your name for our workers and training. And we're asking that tonight you will send forth your word once again to every heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Give us understanding Amen. and impart your spirit and life to everyone tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. And we pray, Lord, that there will be zeal to carry out what you are teaching us in your word. Amen. We pray you energize everyone. Amen. Help us to be doers of the word. Amen. We'll not be hearers only. Amen. Confirm your word in every life. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. God bless you. You can get stated. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 32. Jeremiah chapter 32, I'm reading from verse 38. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 38. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God, and I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me forever, for the good of them and of their children after them. Verse 40, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. I'll put my fear in their heart. I'll put my reverence, my honor, my desire in their hearts so that they will not depart from me. Tonight we are looking at the word of God on covenant with consecration against turning back. Covenant with consecration against turning back. You find in those three verses we are read together now that God says that he will bring people to himself and he will be his people and he will be their God. And then he said, I'll give every one of them the same heart and that heart I give them would make them follow one way. Not only that, they'll fear the Lord, not just for a time, not just for a period, They'll follow the Lord and fear the Lord throughout their lives. In fact, it says forever. For the good of them, that is, it will be to their profit, it will be to their good, and for the good of their children as well. And then he tells us in verse 40, it's a covenant. He says, and I will make an everlasting covenant of them. He's talking about the new covenant, the everlasting covenant. The covenant that Christ has come to make with us now. And it brings us to the Lord. We come to the family of God. And it gives us the mind of Christ and the heart of the Lord himself. And we love him with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind. And he says, I will not turn away from them. He's comparing this or contrasting this with the old covenant. Under the old covenant, there were times God said, Moses, let me wipe them out. Let me destroy them. And I'll make of you a greater nation than they could ever be. And Moses pleaded with the Lord. But now he says, this new covenant I'm going to make with my people. I will not turn away from them. And they will not turn away from me either. Because he says, I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. Covenant that comes with consecration. That now we consecrate ourselves to the Lord that we will not turn back. When we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, that's a great experience. That's called conversion. And it is what makes us people of God, children of God, the sons and daughters of God, members of the family of Christ. I want to compare that with the natural birth. Like the natural birth, being born into the world is exciting. And it is joyful and wonderful. And yet, there are those who are born and they die in infancy. 
When he died in infancy like that, the joy is gone. The same thing when we're born again. If somebody gets born again, is born into the kingdom of God, and that conversion, that new birth, gives joy. Joy in the heart of the one that is born again. And joy in the family of God. The people that say, we are the family of God, and we see this one is born again is brought into the kingdom the name is written in the book of life is adopted into the family of god he has joy we have joy and there's joy in heaven but when that baby in christ when he dies he dies in infancy is gone back from the lord is turned away from the lord all our joy is gone because children who die in infancy there's no joy in the family anymore and sometimes those babies they remain for some time it's not a stillbirth it's not that they die very very young they're continuing and continuing and continuing and eventually something happens and maybe they die again it brings sorrow and suffering a very painful experience to the appearance that give birth to them but there are some children, they don't die like that. They appear to be alive, they exist, but they are perpetual babies. The child is already 10, that child is already 15. And when you look at that child, the way he talks, the way he acts, it's like uh, the child is just about a year old. And the parents are unhappy, especially when you say, how old is this boy? How old is this child? It's like a dagger in their hearts because the child is 13, the child is 15, and it's like just one year old. Do you know there are people like that in the family of God? They say they are born again. How old are you in the kingdom of God? They've been here in the kingdom for 15 years, for 17 years, and they do not know anything at all in the kingdom of God. They're like spiritual babies. And, but the church doesn't care. The church doesn't bother about that. That this person is, uh, you know, a teenager already spiritually, and yet like a two-year-old baby in the Lord. And sometimes, like, uh, you know, I listen to all these um, house fellowship, uh, what we're doing with the house fellowship, and sometimes I'm wondering, you know, what are we going to teach? We're teaching some of the people that have been babies in the Lord, and they've been babies for 20 years. And then we're asking these uh, basic questions from them, uh, and sometimes they've been 20 years in the Lord, they can't understand. And they can't answer that. They can't answer the simple, simple things we're asking them. And you know, our house fellowship leaders and our teachers we just say, praise the Lord. God bless you. God bless you. If that was your biological child, and that child is 20 years of age and cannot read the alphabet, you'll be smiling and say, God bless you. I cannot put a sentence together, cannot bring this and this together. you say, God bless you. You'll be sorrowful. And the same thing will transfer now into the kingdom of God that the people were teaching, the people who have come into the kingdom, it's not just that they are there, they are bench warmers, or they are there, they are still babies, they are rising up and they are going to grow in Jesus' name. In fact, you know sometimes perpetual babies in the family, they cause more sorrow to the parents than those children that died in infancy. Those ones that died in infancy, you're forgotten about them. That one died about five years ago. She died about uh, seven years ago. Although you remember, but it's you know faded away from memory. But this one that is there, 18 years of age in the family, and then you're still from feeding that person is a sorrow to the family. The same thing in the kingdom of God, it's like, uh, you know, some people are just part of the population. They're part of the counting. We know that they are there. They contribute nothing. They do nothing. They are parasites. And they cannot even feed themselves. They cannot have a successful quiet time by themselves. They are part of the statistics, but they are not part of the growing church and the militant church of the Lord. They contribute nothing to society spiritually. They contribute nothing to the church. That is going to change. I said that is going to change. 
when fathers and mothers become concerned, like you're concerned in your own personal family, that that child has been there for a long time now, and a child is not even going to school, but look at another situation. It, this child was born, and then you send the child to kindergarten, you send the child to uh, daycare, you send the child to primary school, you send the child to secondary school. You have even spent a fortune, and you have sent this child to a university. But there is work to do. The child is not willing to do any work. At 25, he graduates, and is there with you. And you, mommy or you, daddy, you'll go to work and come back home. You are the one to buy dress for her. You are the one to buy dress for him. And you are the one to do everything. He cannot contribute anything. He has a certificate and you have labored on this child. But the child is unproductive. He cannot contribute anything. Bring it to the church. All these uh, workers, you know, we have workers there today. Are there workers there today? Where are they? Wonderful. You educate these people. All the people that are coming to Saturday workers training. And we come and we have this training and we say praise the Lord. I never saw that before. And we write notes and we trade. And now we should have backbone to our conviction. And we should go out and get something done. But no. Certificate, no job. The job is there. We're not willing to do it. And the people who are not our children, they are outside there. And those other people, other people's children, if they cannot get white collar job, they're pushing something, they are selling something, they are trading somewhere, they're doing something. And our own children, they're not challenged. Our own children, they just sit down there, parasites in the family. I pray that that will change in our church. So that as we are trained, as we are trained, you are trained to do the work. Then you rise up, you say, I lay my hands on the plow and I will not turn back. I said, you lay your hands on the plow and you will not turn back. That's why the Lord is saying that he's going to make a covenant with us. A covenant that comes to consecration that says, here am I. I'm going to do something in the kingdom of God. I can see that there are going to be new pastors here. Yeah. New evangelists there. Yeah. And then women, you know, sometimes uh, a deeper life, uh, women, they, they know the Bible as much as the men. Uh, but it's like, uh, you know, the, I, I think even our, our men, they are, the men in deeper life will contribute to the situation of our sisters, our mothers who are here in deeper life. It's like, Everything is to be done by the man. They can only sing. And you know, I showed it to you the other time about the Levites. All those Levites, they were men. Did you, did you get that? You see, as you read and read and read, the people to carry this, they were men. The people to carry the ark, they were men. The people to bring down the tabernacle and then to pitch it somewhere, they were men. And the people that David chose that will play instruments, that will uh, sing, they were men. Only when Solomon came, if you read Ecclesiastes, that he said, I have singing men and tell me, Singing women. That's the only time. But all the other times, they were singers. They were men. But you know, we're not really following the Bible because we have women singers. The sisters, they sing. And nobody, nobody uh, blames us for that because we expect that to be done. But when it comes to a woman making an announcement, uh -uh, what is that? Now tell me, which one is more spiritual? Singing or making announcement? I've lost my class. Singing is more spiritual. We allow women to sing in the choir. We allow them to even sing solo. We allow them to take the whole platform and lead choruses and the directors and then we follow them. And when they lead song, they do that and nobody quarrels about that. But if a woman comes here and he says, let's listen to these announcements, People are shaking their heads. What's that? They're changing the Bible. Which Bible are we changing? When they were singing, we didn't change the Bible. And then when they help us to carry all those things, we didn't change the Bible. When they cook during the retreat, we didn't change the Bible. Now they make announcement. And what's that announcement? 
Can women pray? Okay, let's say uh, let the men answer because the men are the people that are stopping us. They are the people standing away and they're saying, uh uh, this is man's territory. I find a sister coming up here now, and then I say, Take that microphone and pray. And they you know, the preachers are looking at the men are looking at me that you know something came on the G yesterday. The spirit of the Lord came upon me. I said the spirit of the Lord is upon me. The point I'm making to you is there are traditions we need to change. Because if we don't change those traditions, we'll have women. You know, when you were young, I mean very young, I don't mean, you know, some of you, some of you, when you were young was just yesterday. But those of us, uh, look at me here, when I was young. You know, to find a woman driving uh, the, a bus, that will be strange. Because it's only men that will do that. When you were very young, or when I was very young, a woman could be a nurse, but not a medical doctor. But now, things are changing. The director there, that's a woman. The driver there, that's a woman. The one that is uh, driving that train or driving that bus, that's a woman there. A vice chancellor of a university, that's a woman there. And all those things. Why is it the world is moving on, the world is making progress, and we are not making progress? Our time of progress has now come. Yeah. We will lay our hands on the plow and we're not going to turn back in Jesus' name. When I was talking to you about the Levites, I said, the singing we're doing, that's good, that's good. That's the basis. You hold on to that. We're not saying that you'll stop singing. No, you continue singing, but you add evangelism. You continue playing the instrument and you add preaching. You continue with the work God is helping you to do already. And that work is successful and the Lord is going to reward you in Jesus' name. And then you add another thing. You are not going back. You are moving forward. I'm moving forward. I said I'm moving forward. Now, to start with, you must understand that when you read the scriptures and then you commit yourself to the Lord, you come with a covenant, a covenant before the Lord and consecration before the Lord and uh, you will not turn back. You will not turn back in Jesus' name. You are born, you are growing, you are developing, but there are some people that have negative influence in society. You see, they have been born. They didn't die, we're happy. They went to school, we're happy. They were trained, we're happy. But in life, instead of becoming productive, practical people, they go into crime. And they have negative influence on society. And sometimes, those criminals, people will say, it might have been better if they had died in infancy. The same thing in the church. There are people, they didn't backslide. They didn't die in infancy, but they are there now. And they're just there and sitting there on the bench. And every time they have negative influence, it's like they're criminals in the church. They are alive. They say they are members of the church. Just like in the world, you'll pack up all those criminals and put them in the prison so that society can move forward. You'll not be a criminal in the church. Amen. You'll not have negative influence in the church. Amen. You will come everything you have, all the training you've got, all the power you've got, all the skill you've got. You bring everything you've got, and then we're going to join hearts and hands together, and we're going to make progress in Jesus' name. Amen. Today is a day of covenant. A day of consecration. And it is that we're laying our hands on the plow and we're not looking back. You'll not look back in Jesus' name. Luke chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 62. Luke chapter 9, verse 62. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. You'll be fit for the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. We're coming to this uh, and we're looking at uh, three points. Number one, caution and counsel against turning back. Caution and counsel against turning back. Caution and counsel against turning back. Point number two, 
causes and consequence of turning back. What causes that? Why do people turn back? The causes and the consequence of turning back. Point number three, commendation and crowning for not turning back. Commendation and crowning for not turning back. Point number one, tell me out loud. Caution and counsel against turning back. We're looking at Genesis chapter 19. Genesis chapter 19, and we're reading from verses 16 and 17. Genesis chapter 19, and we're reading from verse 16, and reading from verse 17. Here you'll find the family of Lot, how the angel held their hand, and the angel counseled them, cautioned them uh, that they should not look back. We're looking at it, 19, 16. And while he lingered, the men, the angels actually laid hold, laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters. And the Lord be merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and said him that is the whole family without outside the city in verse 17 and it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said escape for thy life escape for thy life look not behind thee look not behind thee that was the message of the angels that was the message of the counsel of the angels that was a caution they were given look not behind thee and then he goes on to say, Neither stay in all the plain, escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. That's the message we still have today, that the Lord has brought us out of the world. He has brought us out of a worthless life, a useless life, out of a life that, you know, had no meaning. And now he says, look to the mountain, look at the mountain. And that is the place you ought to get to. You must not be in the valley. You must not be a mediocre. You'll not be a mediocre. And you must not be somebody that has nothing, knows nothing, and does nothing, and contributes nothing. Escape to the mountain. Look not behind thee. Look at verse 26. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became what? A pillar of salt. And she became a pillar of salt. You know what Jesus said? Look at Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, the Lord Jesus Christ, now talking to his own followers, talking to his own disciples, and talking to the people who are partakers of the new covenant that he came to establish in Luke chapter 17, and reading from verse 28, likewise also, as it was in the days of Lord, they did eat, they drank, they bought and they sold and they planted and they built it. But the same day that Lot went out, that he got out, he went out of Sodom, he trained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Verse 30, even so, even thus, even in the same way, even thus shall it be when the Son of Man is revealed. Verse 32, everybody, one, two, three, go. Say that out loud. Remember, Lord's wife. That's Jesus Christ. You know, there are people that will tell us today that once you are born again, you are forever born again. Once you are saved, you are forever saved. Once uh, you are facing the direction of heaven, that's all, that's all. You don't have any other thing to do. But Jesus said, as it was in the time of Lord, when they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving marriage and sowing and reaping and doing everything and building, that the same day that Lord went out of Sodom and Gomorrah, he trained fire and brimstone then it says remember lord's wife that's the caution that's the counsel don't just take things for granted and say i'm there i'm always there no you have to make up your mind no, you have to be determined. No, you have to be decisive. No, you have to deny yourself. And then you have to focus on the place you are going. The Lord has called me. I will not go back. I said I will not go back. We're looking at Psalm 85. Psalm 85. And we're looking at verse 8. Psalm 85. We're looking at verse 8. Psalm 85. 
verse 8. It says in verse 8, I will hear what God the Lord will speak. For he will speak peace unto his people. Peace unto you. Amen. Peace in your family. Amen. And peace in your life. Amen. And as you go to walk every confusion, the Lord drive away from you in Jesus' name. Amen. But look at the latter part of that verse 8. But he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints. But... But let them not turn again to folly. It says he's blessing us. He's giving us his peace. He's giving us his power. But then it says, let them not turn again to folly. It says, remember, Lord's wife. You see what the uh, Galatians, Galatians chapter 4, what the Galatians after they came to know the Lord, and there were some things that made them look back. There were some things that made them look back to tradition and to the religion of the Jews. Instead of understanding, we're saved by the blood of the Lamb. We're saved by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Look at what happened to them. We're looking at verse 9. In verse 9, chapter 4, chapter 4 of uh, Galatians, verse 9, uh, it says in verse 9, But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Now, you need to understand what Paul, the apostle, was talking about. You see, many of these people, they came from the religion of the Jews. And the religion of the Jews emphasized circumcision. Or those who did not come from the religion of the Jews, uh, they, they heard that those Jews emphasized circumcision. Now they were born again. And it was Christ that made them to be born again. And there was no circumcision involved, no tradition involved. As they came to the Lord, now the Jews were coming to them. And they were compelling them. And they were saying, if you want to be really saved, and if you want to stay saved, and if you want your or church or your fellowship to be approved of God and approved of the Jewish people, you must be circumcised. And they were getting confused. And that's why Paul the Apostle said, you have been born again. You have been adopted into the family of God. How is it to are turning back to the beggarly elements? As you look at church, you look at you know the church that had been uh, before our church, the Catholic church had been there. Anglican church had been there. And all these other churches, they have been there. But you will understand. It's not everything. The Bible, they understood. For example, Methodist church, uh, a beloved, um, you know, preacher of holiness. What's his name? John Wesley. He was still practicing infant baptism. But we're not going to say because we respect, we respect John Wesley and then go back to the beggar elements and then practice infant baptism. And then there are some things so that churches too, they were doing that limited them and they limited themselves to what the people are being. In some churches, they believe the repentance, they believe restitution, they believe salvation, but they don't believe evangelism. You must be ordained. They must pour oil upon you. You must be an anointed and they must say that you and you and you you are building you are the only people that can preach but how many of them are preaching the gospel how many of them are turning the world upside down but as we look at the bible it says all that was scattered abroad they went everywhere what were they doing they were preaching the word if we're going to stay with the bible we cannot look back to all those other churches and say since they are born again they are our seniors they have been before us therefore what they are doing we will do if we do like that the church will not amount to anything in the world today but this church will rise up Amen. and you are the church i said you are the church when I say this church will rise up, that means uh, who will rise up? You will rise up. And when you rise up, men will rise up, women will rise up. Give me a good amen. 
and we're not going to hinder anybody that we know that this is a child of God and wants to get something done. Uh, what if, for example, you saw uh, any of our sisters on the you know street corner, and instead of just talking to only one person, we have a hundred people before her on the street, and then she said, "Hear the word of the Lord Jesus Christ, a Savior." And then after saying that Jesus Christ is Savior, He gives them invitation to come to the Lord, and then they come to the Lord, and then said, "Don't go yet, don't go yet. God will open the eyes of the blind." Sisters, I'm talking about you. And then if you are lame today, you are going to rise up and walk. Can that happen? Yes. I said, can that happen? Yes. And the name of Jesus was he given only to the men? No. The baptism in the Holy Ghost was it only given to the men? No. What did Jesus say? He shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria, then to the uttermost part of the earth. And the Holy Ghost came on all of them, men and women. Are the women to use the Holy Ghost to go and cook in the kitchen? No, but you know, you know what the early church did? You know what they did? Only 12 apostles. They were preaching, they were preaching. And then when the distribution of food was not getting to the widows in time, the apostles rose up. This traditional, this traditional, and he said, Now we will give ourselves to prayer. I thought that's for everybody. I thought Jesus said to the men and the women, what did he say? Men not always to pray. That man is, you know, everybody there, ought always to pray. And uh, not to faint, but now they said, we men will give ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Then they said, choose us out, tell me. Choose us out. Seven men. How about the women? We're even talking about distributing food now. They said, choose men. And men who are full of the Holy Ghost and they are men of honesty who we may appoint unto this business i even thought if you are going to appoint anybody to dispute food you should appoint the women but the tradition of the jews had so much effect on them the women will not do anything we can only see the women we must not hear them talk not hear them say anything and the church is still like that and it, half of the whole population, any population, any place where you have, let's say you have 10 million there, it's likely that 5 million of them or even more will be women. And then the women in the church, they are quiet, they are silent, they are not doing anything. All of us are going to work this time. Yeah. All of us are going to evangelize this time. All of us, all of us are distributing tracts. All of us are talking to people. All of us were reaching out to people. We're not allowing tradition to, you know, tie us down and pull us back. And then what you were not doing before, get ready. It's time to rise up and do something. I said you will do something. Because here in the word of God, it says, I is it to turn back to beggarly elements? And if you remember the story, they appointed of those seven they appointed in Acts chapter 6, tell me the first name, Stephen. Tell me the second name. Ah, you have forgotten your Bible. Tell me the second name there, Philip. And then they, they said, distribute food. But well, thank God, thank God. Somebody say, thank God. Somebody say, praise the Lord. That same Acts chapter 6, I didn't even see the distribution of food that Stephen did, but then he was talking to the people, and then signs and wonders were being done by him. He, he was not tied down to the beggarly elements. And then we come to chapter 8 of Acts of the Apostles, who is the main figure in chapter 8 of Acts. Philip, the one they said should be distributing food, and then he went to Samaria. Persecution drove them. If you don't listen to me, for me to drive you there, for me to appoint you, and for me to tell you to do it, persecution will do it for me. Yeah. Will drive us there. And we will do it in Jesus' name. Yeah. I think it's better if I told you and you did it. Rather than if persecution came and then you have no choice and then uh, persecution will get uh, the you know, benefit of uh, you know, driving you out. No, I think uh, persecution to stay aside, I will do it. I will say you go, and you go, and you will go, and you will succeed. 
you will preach the gospel and many will come to the Lord in Jesus name how turn ye to beggarly elements we're not going to turn to beggarly elements anymore in Jesus name we will not go back we will not turn back we have laid our hands on the plan. We're going to do the will of God. We're looking at Psalm 40. Psalm 40. I'm reading from verse 4. Psalm 40, verse 4. It says, Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turned aside to lies. Turned aside to lies. Turned aside to lies. Hey, look at uh, verse 7 here. In verse 7 it says, Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O oh my God. You will do the will of God. I said you will do the will of God. Coming to the Savior, that's life. That's eternal life. But turning away from the Savior, that's death, spiritual death. Some people, they turn away from the Lord. Totally, they backslide. They backslide. They were born into the kingdom. And then instead of staying with the Lord, they turned away from the Lord. Number two, some people turn away from the truth. They turn away from the truth. They turn their ears away from the truth. And they don't want to hear the truth anymore. That's backsliding too. Somebody might, uh, you know, still be in the church and say, I'm part of them. And yet, it's not wanting to hear the truth. And when the truth comes to him, uh, he doesn't want to obey the truth. Second Timothy chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 3. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own laws shall they heed to themselves teachers having itching ears. Look at verse 4. And they shall turn, tell me, they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables, shall be turned unto fables. It will not happen to you. Amen. Number one, some turn away from the Lord. Number two, some turn away from the truth. Number three, some turn back from the covenant consecration they made to the Lord many years ago. You laid everything on the altar. You said, Lord, I will serve you. Lord, I'll proclaim your word. Lord, I will tell other people about the salvation of the Lord. But that covenant, they have turned away from that covenant. Number four, some people turn away from his service, from the soul winning. That is, uh, you know, in your younger years who said, this truth I know, this light I've got, everybody must have this. Everybody must receive this. And then you did it for some time, but now you've turned away from that service and from the soul winning. Number five, some people turn away from his family. From his family. Here is the family of God. And they prefer to isolate themselves somewhere. And they lose the fellowship and the love and the grace and the joy of being together in the family. They turn away from his family. Number six, some people turn away from the faith. They turn away from the faith. Then number seven, some people turn away from the narrow path, the narrow way that leads to heaven. And now they go on the broad way that leads to perdition. But uh, I see people here tonight, you will not turn back. Amen. You will not turn away. Amen. You'll keep on with the Lord for the rest of your life in Jesus' name. Point number two, the causes and the consequences of turning back. The causes, why do people turn back? Why is it they were following after the Lord and eventually they turned away and they turned back? First Samuel chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 11. First Samuel chapter 15, reading from verse 11. It repenteth me that I have set Saul to be king, for he is turned back from following me here the lord confirmed Saul was following the lord before he was you know he was born again he was a child of god he was converted because we're told in first samuel chapter 9 and chapter 10 that as he turned back from samuel the lord gave him another heart and was humble as well he was willing to obey the lord but now the lord said it repenteth me 
that have set Saul to be king. For he is turned back from following me, and he has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all the night. And now, why did he do that? Verse 17. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, was thou not made head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. And the Lord sent thee on a journey, and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, and didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? Here you find the accusation. They are turned away from the Lord. He gave some excuses, but eventually he came out to say, uh, let's look at uh, verse uh, 21. But the people took the spoil of the sheep, the sheep and oxen, and the chief of the things that uh, should have been utterly destroyed, and uh, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. You see, that's the excuse. We did that so that we can sacrifice it to the Lord thy God. There are many people who are giving some excuses to them. We are not doing that because we want to remain a need, we want to remain this or this and that. It's an excuse. And there's no excuse that will be tenable, acceptable in the sight of the Lord in not obeying the Lord. Look at verse 22. And Samuel said as the Lord has great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold to obey is better than sacrifice and to hack in than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word, here is the consequence now, the consequence of turning away from the Lord. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. I pray I will not reject you. But you know, if uh, the Lord has called us to get something done, he's teaching us the word of God, and he's uh, telling us this is the way we are therein. And the greatest thing he has given to us is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Evangelize, win the souls, bring them in in the harvest, and do the work I've given you to do. And if we give excuses, so I'm doing this because of that, I cannot evangelize. I am involved in that other thing, I cannot evangelize. It becomes disobedience unto the Lord. And uh, that disobedience will be visited by the wrath of God. We're coming to 1 Kings chapter 13. 1 Kings chapter 13. And I'm reading from verse 16. 1 Kings chapter 13. We're reading from verse 16. It says in verse 16, And he said, I may not return with thee. No go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt eat no bread nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. Look at verse 18. And he said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel speak unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. Tell me the rest. Tell me out loud. But he lied unto him. Do backsliders lie? So-called prophets, do they lie? Prophetesses, do they lie? The religious people, do they lie? There are many people, they have heard the word of God. You've heard the word of God, and the Lord has made it very clear and very plain that this is what you do. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And it says that work is given to every one of us. If you're a child of God, you have the gospel. You must not be ashamed of sharing that gospel and telling other people that this is the way. Walk ye therein. And then somebody comes to you in the corner somewhere and then tells you something. And what 
what he's telling you is contrary to what the Lord has told you and is lying unto you. And then there's a false prophet, old prophet, he supported his lie by the vision of an angel. An angel spoke to me to bring you back. And this man forgot what the Lord had told him earlier. And so in verse 19, so he went back with him and did eat in his house and drank water. Not a big deal. Just eat. Just drink water. Some people will say, what's the sin in that? Even though the Lord had told him not to eat there, not to drink water there, are we going to penalize a man for just drinking water? Are we going to penalize a man for just, uh, you know, eating bread? There are some people that will tell us that, uh, what are we saying? Uh, uh, whatever, even though the Lord has said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, I'm not idle to you. I'm working for God to you. I am doing this in the church. I'm doing that in the church. I'm doing that in the church. And then they might be talking to some other people. All this uh, new emphasis, evangelism, evangelism. Is it everybody that will evangelize? All this uh, new emphasis, soul winning, soul winning. Is it everybody that will win soul? I, but what I'm doing in the church, if I'm not doing that, how will the church be? And the things I'm doing here, the things I'm doing here, let's say I remove my hand now. In fact, maybe I will even do that. I will, I will let them know how important this is. And they're doing all that and saying all that because there's a spirit of disobedience, not only wanting to evangelize and they want to convince other people and they want to confuse other people they will not confuse you Amen. you will not turn back and so this man went back just to eat and to drink water see what happened in verse 24 and when he was gone a lion met him by the way and slew him and his carcass was cast in the way and the ass stood by each and the lion also stood by the carcass verse 25 and behold men passed by and saw the carcass cast in the way and the lion standing by the carcass and they came and told in the city where the old prophet uh, dwelt. And look at this, verse uh, 26. And when the old prophet, the prophet uh, that uh, brought him back by the way, heard thereof, he said, what did he say? It is the man of God who... Look at the man. Look at this man judging that young prophet who was disobedient and he was the one that influenced him to be disobedient. You see, I pray you'll not become a Jonah. That the Lord has said, this is what you go and do. And then an old prophet, an old timer, an old member of the church comes to you and he says, times have changed. Look at the economy. Look at this. Look at this. Who can tell anybody now that you will not keep two jobs? Who can tell anybody now you will not go to extramoral studies? Who can tell anybody now not to, you know, you have office work. You also, you can be a trader as well and join things together. Who can tell anybody not to, not to make all the money you can make? Don't listen to them. Go and do this. And because it's an old, old timer, it's been there for a long time, then you sit back. I pray that judgment will not come upon you. But look at the man, the man that brought him back, he appeared to even be free. No lion came to him. But the young prophet that uh, went back because he was deceived, that's the one the lion went to. The lion will not come to you. Yeah. Will not break your bone. Yeah. I will not stop your journey up in Jesus' name. Yeah. You will not die before your time. Yeah. I see you living long. Yeah. I said I see you living long. Yeah. And as you obey the Lord, he might even give you, if you really want to do this evangelism, somebody there, you want to do evangelism, where are you? He might give you 15 more years. Amen. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And then you'll be stronger and stronger in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, don't allow any old person there, old man, old woman, sitting at the back there and say, no, that's how they say, that's how they say. You say, no, I had the word of God myself. I'll be a doer of the word. I'll not be a hearer only. And my life will be totally committed, consecrated unto the work of the Lord, evangelism and soul winning in Jesus' name. And we're looking at Job chapter 34. Job chapter 34. And I'm reading from verse 20. Job chapter 34 and I'm reading from verse 24 look at this it says 
he shall break in pieces mighty men without number and set others in their stead therefore he knoweth their works and he overturneth them in the night so that they are destroyed and then he goes on to say strike them as wicked men in the open sight of others but why look at verse 27 the reason he strikes them the reason he judges them the reason he destroys them and the reason he lays his wrath and anger upon them because they turned back from him and would not consider any of his ways his way of saving the lost his way of rescuing the perishing his way of getting those sinners out of darkness and bringing them into the light because they will not consider his ways and because they turned back from following him that's why he struck them and i pray the lord will help you we're coming to psalm 78 psalm 78 i read from verse 41 psalm 78 and we're looking at verse 41 psalm 78 we're reading from verse 41 in psalm 78 verse 41 it says yea they turned back and tempted the lord and tempted god and limited the holy one of israel you see when you turn back from the word of god when you turn back from the assignment the lord has given us it's like you're limiting the holy one of israel he can use men he cannot use women he can use adults he cannot use youths he can use Eli, he cannot use Samuel. He can use Isaiah, he cannot use Jeremiah. He can use Aaron, he cannot use the Stamara Moses. You're limiting the Lord. And that's why some people turn back. They say, look at yourself. Look at you, you know yourself. And you know your limitations. And you know your incompetence. And you know this and you know that. And they limit the Lord. I will not limit the Lord. You will not limit the Lord in your life in Jesus' name. That's why they turned back. Look at verse 42. They remembered not his hand, nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy. Look at verse 56. In verse 56, yea, they tempted and provoked the Most High and kept not his testimonies. Verse 57, but they turned back and dealt unfaithfully like their fathers they were turned aside like a deceitful bomb and that means then we need to yield to the lord and understand he doesn't want us to turn back he wants us to move ahead and go ahead and do the work he has given us to do we're coming to luke chapter 9 luke chapter 9 i'm reading from verse uh, from verse uh, 61 Luke chapter 9 verse 61 and another also said Lord I will follow thee Lord I will follow thee anybody that will follow the Lord there you're following Jesus name but look at this but let me first go but let me first go I have something that is more important than the assignment let me first go and do that I have something a project I'm looking at now and then to get that done first let me first go and bid farewell to them which are at my house and Jesus said unto him you cannot lose time and still be in favor with God you cannot lose opportunity and still be in favor with God. You cannot lose the chance the Lord is giving you now and still be in favor with the Lord. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. I pray will be fit for the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. What are the causes of drawing back, of looking back, of turning back? Number one, canal influence from other people somebody came to you and you know is uh, having this influence on you and, and you look at people by their age in the ministry by their long-standing stature in the church and whatever they say you just take that and yet they have a negative influence on you you know that every time they influence you the spirit of god is not flowing in your life they dampen your spirit and they kill your spirit and they bring darkness and confusion and because of them you're not rising up you're not standing up and you're not moving you're not running because of their carnal influence number two lying 
lying prophets, lying prophets. They may come with their dreams, they come with their exhortation, they come with their prophecy, they come with their lies, and they're just lying prophets. And then yielding to negative pressure, yielding you know, to negative pressure. Didn't Saul, King Saul, say that? He said, The people, the people, they wanted to get all those things so they can sacrifice them to your God. And he yielded to the negative pressure. And uh, pressures come to everybody. Pressures will come to you. And it can bring the pressures this way or that way. It can be psychological pressure. It can be physical pressure. It can be verbal uh, pressure. That they say to you every time. But if you are going to be a man that's worth anything in the kingdom of God. Pressures will not make you turn back. Other people have weak heart resolve. Their resolve is weak. Their determination is weak. And because of that, that's why they turn back. Other people, it's because of unbelief and limiting God. God cannot choose me, I'm still a child. God cannot choose me, I'm just a boy. God cannot choose me, I'm a woman. God cannot choose me, this is all I can do. Because of unbelief and limiting God. Or else because of family ties. Family ties. And the wife will say, you're going again. Or the husband will say, you're going again. Or it's your daughter that will say, daddy, you're going again. Or it is uh, your son that will say, mommy, you're going again. You see, because of those uh, family ties, some people are not able to rise up and obey the Lord. But thank God, things are changing now. The gospel will be number one in your life. Evangelism will be number one in your life. Church planting will be number one in your life. Other people, they view God and his demand so hard. They view God and his demand so hard. We're looking at John, John chapter 6. We're looking at John chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 16. John chapter 6, verse 16. Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this said, this is an hard saying who can hear it. This is an hard saying. Some people, they count the word of God as hard. They count love for God as hard. They count uh, gratitude to God. He has saved me. He shared his blood. He gave everything for me so I can be saved. And then because of that, I need to give everything of God unto the Lord. They, they count that as hard. Look at verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him walk no more with him you will keep on walking with the lord some people going back will not hinder you even your life will encourage those who have gone back to come back and say if so and so can be steady and be steadfast and be doing that i think now i can i said because of you i can because of those sisters we can i can't hear you you'll do it in jesus name Look at verse 67. Then uh, said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? And the Lord is telling you tonight, asking you tonight, others are turning back, others have gone back. Will ye also go away? No. no. Then Simon Peter answered him uh, for the rest of the people, Lord, to whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? Thou hast the word of eternal life, and we believe. Somebody there, I believe and we believe and we are sure that thou art the christ the son of the living god and so we understand the causes why they went back but you see it's because some of them they had lack of consecration they had not put everything on the altar and they have not said this single life i have i give unto you my time i give unto you my talent i give unto you my treasure i give unto you and they consecrate that unreservedly to serve the lord what's the consequence of turning back number one rejection because you've rejected the word of the lord the lord has also rejected you number two incalculable loss loss that you cannot calculate it says your kingdom would have continued forever but now the lord says it shall not be so number three spiritual darkness defilement and death when you turn back you turn back from life eternal you turn back from the resurrection life the lord had given you and then number four divine 
anger, wrath, and judgment. When people turn back, God's anger is on them. God's wrath is on them. And you can see that a young prophet that was slain by the lion because he turned back. And Jesus said, if you lay your hand on the plow and you're looking back, you're not fit for the kingdom. You become unfit for the kingdom when you turn back. Other people, they shame and sorrow and suffering. Other people, they turn to Satan and Satan eventually holds them in bondage. Turning back, if you turn back from the Savior, you turn to Satan, you'll not turn back to Satan. Yeah. We're looking at uh, first, uh, Timothy, first Timothy, I'm reading here from chapter 5. First Timothy chapter 5, uh, we're reading from verse 12. First Timothy chapter 5 verse 12. Having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. They have damnation, damnation because they have turned back uh, from their first faith. Look at verse 15. For some already turned aside after who? After Satan. But uh, let's look at a man. We're looking at uh, Judges chapter 11. Judges chapter 11. And I'm reading from verse 35. Judges chapter 11. Verse 35. Judges chapter 11. This is important. I want you to underline it to your Bible if you have not done so already. Judges chapter 11. Verse 35. And it came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low. And thou art one of them that trouble me. For, tell me, one, two, three, go. I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. Read that again. For I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, but I cannot go back. Again, for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. You know the story here. Uh, Jephthah was going to the battlefield. And then Jephthah said, when I come back, Lord, if you grant me the victory, whatever meets me as I come, I'll sacrifice him. I'll sacrifice that thing unto you. As a good sacrifice, final sacrifice, in, in gratitude to the fact that you give me the victory. And as he was coming back, the only daughter he had, now came to meet him. And that's why he said, you have brought me very low. Because now I'm going to consecrate you to the Lord. And I'm going to give you totally to the Lord. I don't have any other child. Therefore, you bring me low. It means it's going to stop my posterity. And yet, I have opened my mouth to the Lord. And I cannot go back. Look up here. You, might, you may say, okay, that was Jetha. That can be you. You made up your mind. You're going to get something done. And you're going to serve the Lord and lo and behold your daughter went to do something foolish something sinful something defiling that uh, you say uh -uh, if this can happen to my daughter I don't have mouth to preach anymore if this can happen to my daughter I don't have any anything I want to do for the Lord anymore so uh, my daughter you spoiled my ministry my daughter you have taken away my ministry because of what you have done I will not preach you know, you cannot do that. You cannot tell the Lord that and say because your daughter has done something, now all your consecration, everything is forgotten. Sometimes it's your son. It's your son that, uh, you know, you train that son and then you have said, oh Lord, I'm going to serve you. And then the son then does something and then you say, oh my son, you brought me very low. How is it you've done that? Okay, because of what you have done now, how can I be preaching to other people? And my son is not, you know, hearing the gospel. And my son is not listening to me. Okay, because of you, I hand, I hand over my ministry. I'm going to throw away my ministry because of you. Jephthah said, I will not do that. He said, you brought me very low, but I am going to still serve the Lord. You will serve the Lord. I'm sorry, sometimes maybe if your wife does something, and then you say, my wife, sit down here. No, I cannot sit down there. How uh, can you tell me to sit down? I'm going to do what I like. You say, you're not obeying me, your husband. Okay, 
I cannot talk anymore. I cannot talk to anybody. Lord, unless my wife submits to me, I'm not going to preach the gospel. I'm not going to do anything. And then you come back to your wife and say, do you know that what you're doing now, because of you, I'm going to give up the ministry? No, you cannot give up the ministry because of your wife. I said you cannot. You say, my wife, you brought me very low, but all the same, I've opened my mouth to the Lord and I will not go back. Just give me a good amen. amen. Sometimes it's your husband. You know, your husband, and you say, my husband, what kind of life is this? We say, let's go to Bible study. You are dragging your feet. And you are the one that brought me to the church. You are the one, those days when I see you running, I was very much encouraged. And your, your husband is, you know, dragging his feet now. He's uh, slowing down now. And then you say, you, you go to kneel down. You say, God, because my husband is like this, I forsake you. Because my husband is like this, I will not serve you. You cannot do like Jephthah and say, my husband, you brought me very low. But all the same, my husband, wherever you are, whatever you do, you will not go to Bible study, you will not go to service, and then you are going somewhere, the same mountain or valley, and you are praying somewhere, I have opened my mouth to the Lord, I cannot go back. Give me a good amen. amen. You know, sometimes it's your sister in your, you know, your family, your brother in your family, and then you love each other. It's like, you know, you're just like this. And then you'll be coming to deeper life together. And one day, that's your sister, that's your brother heard something, you know, and say, ah. So that's what it means. It means we have to do a situation. We have to follow the Bible. We have to be sanctified. And then comes and says, my sister, I don't think I, I want to go again. You say, I watch. If you don't go, you'll discourage me. You know, we cannot, you cannot stay apart. You know, where you are, I am. Where I am, you are. And the fellow said, I'm sorry, I don't want to continue like that again. But I will, you know, I, after all, our parents were going to uh, whatever church. And then I will go back there. And then you say, I'm discouraged. Then you go back to God and say, what can I do now? Because my sister, my brother is uh, going back to that old place. Therefore, I cannot continue. Me, I will continue. I said, me, I will continue. Uh -uh. Two people in the family cannot go to hell. If we were going to heaven and the other fellow said, now she wants to go to hell. Well, I'm not happy she wants to go to hell, but I will get to heaven. Our family must be represented in heaven. I said, your family must be represented in heaven. So you will say, my sister, you brought me very low. Alas, my sister, alas, my brother, you brought me very low. But all the same, I have opened my mouth to the Lord and I cannot go back. And the spirit of a conqueror, the spirit that will not go back is coming to you right now. No matter what others do, a daughter, a son, a brother, a sister, a wife or husband, whatever they do, you might be unhappy, you might be sorrowful, you might cry, you might weep, you might shed tears, but in the midst of your tears, you say, Lord, I weep, but I'm determined. I cry, but I'm determined. And I've made up my mind, although she's bringing me very low, it's bringing me very low, I've opened my mouth to the Lord, I will not go back. I'll be an evangelist, I'll not go back. I'll be a preacher, I'll not go back. I'll be a worker, I'll not go back. Recession will not stop me. Farming will not stop me. Lack of money will not stop me. Education will not stop me. University will not stop me. College will not stop me. Job or no job will not stop me. I have opened my mouth to the Lord. Somebody there, I have opened my mouth to the Lord and I cannot go back. The Lord will reward you. I said the Lord will reward you. Point number three, commendation and crowning for not turning back. Commendation and crowning for not turning back. We're looking at Ruth, Ruth chapter one. Ruth chapter one, and I'm reading from verse 15. Ruth chapter one, verse 15, and she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back to her people and unto her, or to her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee. 
somebody there entreat me not to leave thee i wanted to i wanted to hear you entreat me not to leave thee not to return from following after thee for whither thou goest i will go and where thou lodgest i will lodge thy people shall be my people thy god my god where thou diest will i die and there will i be buried the lord do so to me and more also if aught but death part thee and me and when she saw when she saw when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her then she left speaking unto her enduring to the end you will endure resisting satan to the end you will resist overcoming the flesh to the end you will overcome leaving all on the altar till the very end you'll consecrate everything serving the master till the very end of your life you will serve the master keeping the faith to the end you will keep the faith winning souls to the very end you will consecrate you'll be holy unto the end faithful unto the end walking unto the end devoted unto the end whatever comes whatever does not come whatever goes and whatever does not go whatever people do whatever people say you've laid your hands on the plow you will not look back strength will come to you power will come to you anointing will come to you as you see sinners out there there'll be something inside you saying talk to them talk to them talk to them and you'll win multitudes unto the lord in jesus name now now if you're going to really obey the lord while the spirit is moving that's the time you'll say i didn't do this yesterday i'll do it today i didn't preach like this yesterday i'll preach today i didn't pray intercede yesterday i'll pray and intercede today and then our leaders the people who have been keeping at the back of the coaching will bring everybody out now and we encourage everyone go and work for the lord and when you walk for the Lord like that, the Lord is going to reward you. And I can see multitudes, multitudes coming to the Lord. You are going to cause joy in heaven. And when you cause that joy in heaven, the Lord will so abundantly bless your life. It will multiply your life. If you are getting other people saved, he will get your child saved. Don't worry about that. He'll get your wife saved. Don't worry about that. He'll get your husband saved. Don't worry about that. You care for the things belonging to the Lord. The Lord will make you special and care for things belonging to you in Jesus' name. Why don't you stand up and tell the Lord, I will not look back. I will not look back. I cannot look back. Whatever happens to a daughter, whatever happens to a son, whatever happens to a husband, whatever happens to a wife, whatever happens to a brother, whatever happens to a sister, whatever happens to anybody, I've laid my hands on the plow. I will not look back. I've opened my mouth to the Lord. I cannot, I cannot, I cannot, I cannot go back. Tell the Lord, tell the Lord, tell the Lord, tell the Lord. He wants you to serve him. He wants you to serve him.